Were you afraid of writer's block? It's one of my greatest fears. Writing is necessary for my sanity. As a writer, I can externalize my fears and insecurities and night terrors on paper, which is what people pay shrinks a small fortune to do. My case, they pay me for psychoanalyzing myself in print. And in the process, I am able to write myself sane, as that fine poet Anne Sexton put it. It's an old technique of therapists, you know? Get the patient to write out his demons. A, um, Freudian exorcism. But the violent energies I have, and there are a lot of them, I can vomit out onto paper. All the rage and hate and frustration, all that's dangerous and sick foul within me. I'm able to spew into my work. There are guys in padded cells all around the world who aren't so lucky. being trapped in a prison of your own mind with a key just out of reach beyond the bars. You stretch your arm, stretching. It's like the key is what? It's, it's moving. It's moving away. If only you could get that key. 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 <sighs> if only I could be like this guy. Am I right? Steven? Edwin King, the personification of the writer's hat trick, popular and successful, has at last started getting some respect from the literary crowd, and his books have staying power, destined to be read long after Uncle Stevie's worm food. Oh, and to think, if only a few things had gone slightly differently early on in King's career, perhaps the world would have never been blessed or cursed with one of the most imaginative, expansive, prolific, and relatable bodies of literary work that only an elite few writers in history have ever been capable of. Right, Lou? Right, Clark? <laughs> you know, something smells fishy here. I mean, how can one man be responsible for all of this and more? To date, Stephen King has written more than six times as many words as William Shakespeare. And William Shakespeare, well, <laughs> he may have not written all his plays anyway. Some people think, not me personally, but some people think that maybe Sir Francis Bacon wrote a few of them. It's also called the Baconian Theory, a theory which is both hotly debated and delicious. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. Because whatever Stephen King is eating, drinking, smoking, in league with, praying to, or slave of, daddy wants a taste. <laughs> Over 60 novels, five nonfiction books, 200 plus short stories and novellas, more than 20 screenplays and television episodes, folks. This is just a running count. Stephen King is still going strong. I mean, hot damn! person fresh out of ideas, such as myself, they could make quite the cozy living piggybacking off of Uncle Stevie's prolific bibliography and just say like, I don't know, devote each episode of their YouTube series to each one of his books. Said person to have enough material to mooch off of till the day he die. A death made all the more sweet after a hollow and empty existence, spent as a sort of literary remora, feeding the shark, that is, Stephen Edwin King. His books have sold over 350 million copies worldwide over the course of more than five decades. They've been adapted into movies and TV shows, miniseries, heck, even musicals. Some of them more than once. Mark my words, they haven't been. They will be. They will be. Except Dreamcatcher. I don't see them ever trying that one again. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> what about the shit weasels? Lord, I will never drink again. And just because the man has written more words than five Bibles, don't you dare start throwing around frigid words like output, content, machine, and churn. As Stephen King himself once tweeted, churning is for butter, not books. Where are you headed, mister? Bangor, Maine. Stephen King's house. Shh. And we are now in day five of our continuing story about the mysterious disappearance of David McCracken, a film writer and director who gained some notoriety for his feature film Bullet County, in which he was also one of the four leads. There's blood black in the moonlight. McCracken will be found safe and sound, but as the days continue to tick on, authorities are admitting they're losing hope. Until tomorrow, this is Danica Dushku with Midworld Nightly News signing off. When you talk about the magic of Stephen King, there's the magic that's on the page, which millions of people know. Uh, but then there's the magic of his personal conduct, the way he lives his life, and the way he supports the things he cares about and believes in. And he is a genuinely kind man. He really gets you into the mind of the characters. That's why I like reading him, because you immediately, he takes you inside. It's not just an external representation of a character. He gets into the workings of what makes them who they are and why they are the way they are. For somebody as prolific uh, and generous as Steve to continue to, uh, to turn out material uh, for his fans, and and continue to make his fans feel like they're part of this. They're on this journey with him. I like to call it, you know, the mutual admiration society. He's responsible for fostering some really impressive talent out there. Like there's some great films that have been adapted up by, you know, by students and or, you know, early career filmmakers that have then gone on to, to make some really spectacular stuff too. And it can be traced directly to, you know, his generosity. Bangor has benefited immensely from, from Stephen and Tabitha. Um, and it, he gives, I mean, we, like I said, he $3 million to the library. So that's a huge chunk of change. But I believe he also just did like 6,500 to um, help kids in a small area in Maine publish their own books. So like, he just comes at it from all angles. What we know about that's public is probably just this little tiny 1% of how much he actually gives. He's always kept putting the books out. He's always kept trying new ideas. He's always kept pushing himself. You know, he was a multimillionaire by the you know, late 70s, early 80s. He, you know, he doesn't need to do this. He does it because he loves writing, because he loves sharing, and he keeps going. And I, I just, I'm in awe of the guy, truly and honestly. All of Stephen King's success is, of course, a black mark in the eyes of the literary elite. And for decades, Stephen King was saddled with the derogatory label of just a horror writer. And hey, you know what? what what's, what's wrong with being a horror writer anyways? Even worse, being a popular horror writer. I would love to be allowed to go around to the front door instead of always having to use the tradesman's entrance. That would be wonderful. But uh, essentially, I'm sort of resigned to the idea that uh, I'm going to be regarded as a popular novelist with a popular novelist's virtues and a popular novelist's faults. And in a sense, that's all right. I'm running my own race now. If it were a matter of critical acceptance, I would stop right now because that's never going to come on the level that you just mentioned. Whoa, 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 never? No, no. No, I don't think so. Not in my lifetime, certainly, and probably not after. Oh boy, oh boy. If I had a time machine, I'd zip on back to this 1993 interview and make a uh, friendly wager with negative Nancy King. Get me a piece of those mad Stephen King residuals. Because in recent years, old Stevie has not only been using the front door, he's pulling a Henry Hill and going downstairs and through the kitchen. I like going this way, better than waiting in the line. Once safe spaces for only elite literary snobs, publications like The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Esquire, The Atlantic, Harper's Magazine, Granta, The Virginia Quarterly Review, McSweeney's, and Playboy have all published King's stories. I only read Playboy for the short stories. He's a hack. Huh? Stephen King. 
Those elite establishments only published his book so they could put his name on it to sell more copies. And, and despite the grunts and groans and mumbles and moans from some of the gatekeepers of the literary establishment, King has racked up quite the trophy case for himself. He's got an O. Henry of... <laughs> Oh, Henry Award for his Hawthorne-inspired short story, The Man in the Black Suit. A Hugo for his non-fiction work, Das Macabre. The 2018 Penn Award for a writer whose body of work helps us understand and interpret the human condition. His romantic time travel novel, 112263, cleaned up on the award circuit, garnering the LA Times Book Prize and appearing on the New York Times Book Review's 10 Best Books of 2011. Oh, I see, you're not impressed yet. Well, 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 in 03, he was awarded the National Book Award for his distinguished contribution to American letters. And in 2015, none other than President Barack Obama himself awarded Stephen King the National Medal of Arts. For decades, his works of horror, suspense, science fiction, and fantasy have terrified and delighted audiences around the world. <laughs> I got a little bling from President Obama yesterday. Can I see that? Yeah. Can I see oh, that? Sight. Our just a horror writer has a David Foster Wallace. What? David Foster Wallace. Mind piping down while I do my thing back here, please? Now, that's an author. Infinite Jest. You ever read Infinite Jest? No. Our just a horror writer <laughs> I've read it three times. David Foster Wallace. Yeah. Okay. Oh, our just a horror writer has now Trojan horsed his way inside Castle Literati. Oh, but don't you worry. Old Steven's still regularly using his so-called tradesman's entrance. Good movie. Bitch in a buzzsaw. So yes, Stephen King is popular. And by his own admission, if he were writing for the money, he'd have quit a long time ago. And oh hell yeah, he's written more than his fair share of horror. But these organizations have bestowed such prestigious awards on Mr. King for the same reason I'm driving 3,000 miles across the country. Stephen King is capital I important as both a distinguished man of letters and as a popular writer, something those hoity-toity literature types despise. And perhaps even more importantly, Stephen King is an enduring cultural figure whose reach is so far and wide that even people who would just as soon read the back of a cereal box than pick up a novel have heard of him. But I'd wager to the majority of folks, Stephen King means who's scary when he's clearly so much more than that. Where are you going, partner? Wherever the wind takes me, compadre. Then saddle up, cowboy. But hey, who gives a flying fart anyway if Stephen King is labeled a horror writer? Well, certainly not fancy pants legal thriller writer John Grisham, who has dubbed his fellow best-selling author as the current holder of ABLB, or America's Best Love Boogeyman. A-B-L-B, America's Best Loved Boogeyman. You know what, John? Thanks. Thanks a lot for helping my case. Well, listen, folks, I care, okay? I care. But most importantly, Stephen frickin' King cares, okay? Except he doesn't. So I never said that I was a horror novelist. I never said that I was a suspense novelist. I never said I was anything except a guy who writes books. Not only does he not care about being labeled just a horror writer, he saw this pigeonholing coming. He could have actively avoided it, and he didn't. After Carrie debuted, Stephen was at a crosswalk, a literal crossroads with his editor, Bill Thompson, and he was met with a dilemma as to what his next published novel should be. Roadwork or the very much a horror novel about vampires, Salem's Lot. Wrong. What's that, amigo? Uh, it's just, uh, it's wrong, man. All, all that stuff you're spouting off there, it's just, uh, it's plain wrong. You look tuckered, muchacho. Try a nap on for size, eh? 
So, Carrie debuts. An editor, Bill, warns him he'll be typed as a horror writer if they do go with the one about vampires, but they both feel Salem's Lot is the stronger novel. So, Stephen flatly tells editor Bill, I don't care what they call me as long as the checks don't bounce. And wouldn't you know it, after Salem's Lot is published, editor Bill's warning comes true. Stephen observes, I was indeed typed as a horror writer, a tag I have never confirmed or denied, simply because Wrong. Simply because I think it's irrelevant to what I do. Hey man, did you ever read Infinite Jest? No. Simply because I think it's irrelevant to what I do, it does, however, give bookstores a handy place to shelf my books. David Foster Wallace, man, now that's... That's a hell of a book. Hey, Paisano, did, did I wrong you in a past life or something? Or... See, the reason I care about dispelling Stephen King's <laughs> reputation as a... <laughs> One moment. <sighs> okay, now where were we? Oh, yeah. See, the reason I care so much about dispelling Stephen King's reputation as the king of horror is, well, scares a lot of people away from Stephen King. And not in the good way he scares us. The bad way. The way that dissuades horror-hating folks from picking up a book written by Stephen King. A book they would otherwise be moved by, possibly even changed by. Because see, the truth is, his breadth of work is as wide as it is deep. You know, I'd wager in a blind test that a lot of readers wouldn't peg the same writer who wrote the gruesome Pet Cemetery as the same guy who wrote the heartbreaking and nostalgic work Hearts in Atlantis. That was certainly the case for one grouchy octogenarian King ran into at the supermarket. This woman came around the corner. She was in one of the, uh, you know, the things you know they have these electric carts for people that don't have really good mobility. I'm always afraid one's gonna stroke out and the thing's gonna go all maximum overdrive, <laughs> crash into everything. But she was a, you know, a, almost a Florida stereotype. She had the golf tan, you know, she's about 140 years old and <laughs> the golf shirt. And she looked at me and then she looked away and then she looked back and she said, I know who you are. You're Stephen King. You make all those scary movies. Well, some people like those, but I don't care for movies like that. I like uplifting things like that Shawshank Redemption. Ah. We're here. What I really respect about King's writing, even today, is that there's always kind of a... I guess you could call it a working class sensibility to it, you know? Um, like when his characters have money problems, it doesn't feel like um, the editor in his brain said, oh, well, they need to be under some strife. It feels like he understands what those money problems are like. He'll probably spend the first, I don't know, 28, 32% of every novel basically saying, meet this character. This is this character's situation. This is their context. This is their issues. This is what's important to them. And after that, then he drops them into the meat grinder and it's just a roller coaster after that, of course. But horror is not about propping up carving dummies and knocking them down. It's about putting real people into dangerous teeth. And the real people is the important part, really. If there is a through line to um, Stephen King's work as a whole this what 70 plus novels at this point i feel like it really kind of shows in the the idea of the quartet um and this idea that it's through connecting with other people that we are able to overcome what scares us and that doesn't mean they're not heartbreaking and they're not scary at times but i feel like there is always this connection he has with his characters and he i think he really loves his characters and I think that comes through in his writing. And that's why they feel like real people and they feel like somebody I can connect with too. It's not all, you know, monsters and, and, and people with powers. You know, there's a lot of kind of quiet horror in Stephen King. And I find that really thrilling. I think that um, being able to read that and sort of see the horror in areas that maybe you didn't expect to see horror, uh, that really makes me appreciate him more and also broadens, I think, all of our perceptions of what horror can be. It's not only writing horror. I mean, he wrote many things that are not in that field and a few movies that are extremely famous like The Shawshank Redemption, Stand By Me, uh, Dolores Claiborne, Misery and, and The Green Mile are not necessarily, uh, not at all in horror. So I think that's obviously a, 
a bad perception that some people have. I trusted him right away to deliver the chills in some respect or another. You know, I, I think I was just also able to relate to the really working class reality of his narratives and his characters. You know, like I didn't grow up in small town USA, but that was a lot more relatable to me than Castle Frankenstein, let's say, or like the teenagers of Fear Street. So I found it very approachable. It definitely widened my vocabulary and yeah, I just consumed it voraciously. He's got all the, the money he needs. He has all the, the fame he needs and all the acclaim and the awards that, that anyone could hope for. Um, but this, uh, it's not why he started doing it. And it's not why he's still doing it in the 70s. You know, and that's that's uh, that's a really admirable thing, I, I think. Well, folks, here we are. The moment of truth. Time to find out how the sausage is made. Being a born and bred blue collar Yankee, Stephen King has an almost aggressively unmagical and workmanlike view of the writing process. And he's almost equally aggressive in his humility. If you like his stuff, eh, he's only partially responsible for that. I don't think greatness is anything even a great writer can take credit for. The only thing you can take credit for is how much you work at your craft, how much you want to refine what you do, and how much better you can get through work. 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 When asked about his writing process, and boy oh boy is he asked about it a lot, it is the one word that comes up most frequently. Probably because, according to him, he is writing all the damn time. When he's in the middle of a project, and well, given his robust body of work, when is he not? He is writing every day, including Christmas, the 4th of July, even his own birthday. In his exceptional memoir on writing, a memoir of the craft, he states, I like to get 10 pages a day, which amounts to 2,000 words. That's 180,000 words over a three month span, a goodish length for a book. Like all writers, he's got good days and he's got bad. Sometimes finishing those 10 pages before noon, and sometimes working into the wee small hours of the morning. Either way is fine with me, but only under dire circumstances do I allow myself to shut down before I get my 2,000 words. Whether it's a slim novel like The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon or the gargantuan 1,153-page beast, The Stand, Stephen maintains. The first draft of a book, even a long one, should take no more than three months, the length of a season. Stephen's nuts and bolts approach to writing, however, doesn't lead him to the conclusion that the stories that result from that approach are also pedestrian. No, to Stephen, writing is work. It's hard, hard work. But the stories that spring from it are, hmm, ethereal and otherworldly. And on writing, Stephen emphasizes, We are talking about tools and carpentry, about words and style. But remember that we are also talking about magic. The word is littered throughout his memoir, and it frequently pops up in his other works as well, both fiction and nonfiction. Books are uniquely portable magic, and writing is magic, as much the water of life as any other creative art. And Dumbo didn't need the feather, the magic was in him. At the beginning of It, Stephen dedicates the novel to his three children and says, Kids, fiction is the truth inside the lie. And the truth of this fiction is simple enough. The magic exists. Fiction. The truth inside the lie. Again, Stephen gives us yet another paradox when it comes to writing and storytelling. And how does Stephen choose to open his memoir on writing? With two epigraphs. The first, from Miguel de Cervantes. Honesty is the best policy. And the anonymous second epigraph, liars prosper. <clears throat> so, writing is both nitty gritty hard work and magic. Hmm, both truthful and fictional. So what exactly is going on here? Is Stephen King sidestepping confronting the hard truths about his chosen craft? Is he being cheeky? <laughs> you know what I think. I think he's lying. All these mysterious convoluted quotes, all this talk of magic and truth and lies, and lies being truth and truth being lies. Perhaps he's in league with a power beyond himself. Perhaps all this murky writing talk is a cry for help. 
but I refuse to believe that so many stories have sprung from just one man, Stephen Edwin King, without at least some helper or guidance from forces much more powerful than us. Take the pyramids in Egypt, for example, right? Historians would like us to think it was slaves who built them, but we all know the truth, don't we? Egyptologists agree that this type of a shape descended from the sky in a giant fireball, made a controlled landing, and people walked out. The first creator gods. Am I saying Stephen King's novels are as awe-inspiring as the Great Pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the world? You're damn right. Here's how I know he's hiding the nefarious truth from us. Because the only reason we have any insight at all about his writing process, his 10 pages a day, his impressively strict work ethic of year-round writing, is because Stephen King himself has told us. The same guy who says, fiction's the truth inside the lie. We've all been sold a bill of goods, folks. Sold to us by our greatest storyteller. <laughs> Uh, it's just a bunch of paper towels and banana peels and plastic. No, the stuff of a writing legend. This is just the stuff of some, some boring guy. Wait a minute. Holy Moses. <laughs> Behold, the very conduit from which ideas flow from Stephen King's brain through his fingertips, through these keys, and onto the page, and into our brains. <laughs> Thanks, Uncle Stevie! <laughs> Woo! Running from the buzz. What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. Man, I'm just a young man. The cool thing with Stephen is like he fools you into feeling safe because it everything feels so familiar in some senses. And like you're just going along and then, you know, sort of sweeps the legs out from underneath you. And it can just, you know, it's just weird to describe to someone like, oh, I love that. That feels like this could happen. But what's happening is actually really horrible and scary. Always get invested in his characters. Like I think about them all the time and they mean something different in different stages of life. Somehow he just, he just puts a hole right into my imagination and like, sits there. I never forget his stories. The audience is everything from, from uh, teenage girls with pink hair to old ladies in, in their 80s with uh, uh, bad backs and gray hair. So his, his audience is everywhere and, and, and between. So no matter what kind of uh, books you like, uh, likely he's written one in that genre. It's these characters that we associate with, we understand, and we remember. That's, I think, what makes his books even more memorable. Um, there are lots of other authors where I've read their entire uh, collection of books, and if you put the book in front of me, I might be hard-pressed to tell you what the story was about and certainly what the characters were. But any King book, as soon as I look at it, I know who the people in it are, and that immediately uh, associates the story in all of its details. I was a big horror geek even before Dr. Sleep, and um, I think everyone was really aware of Stephen King and the Shining universe. It's like an icon of the horror universe. And um, once I'd found out that the audition was for Dr. Sleep, they're like, yeah, this is actually for uh, the sequel to The Shining. I was like, oh gosh, oh wow, this is kind of insane. And when I booked it, I, oh, it was the most surreal feeling in the world. So I'm so happy I got to play Abra. She's definitely one of my favorite roles ever. It was a huge impact on my life and I couldn't be more honored that I got to be a part of it. I don't know how I would tell him like face to face that what he's put out there into the world in terms of the Losers Club, um, in terms of Carrie, in terms of just characters that we have fallen in love with and have like stored away in our reader's heart. Um, like how much that means to people, you know, like the kids in the Losers Club, they all like embody like different characteristics of 
real kids who go through real things like being bullied, um, abuse, like, you know, just being scared and having to do something impossible, but like trying to muster up the courage to do it. We're there through all of that, you know, as a constant reader, watching and learning and just being a part of the Stephen King universe and relating to all of it. Ooh. Stephen King is often asked where he gets his ideas, which if you're a writer, is there any more obnoxious question than that? Sometimes he'll answer in good faith, but most of the time he'll give some sort of cheeky response like, there's a great little bookstore on 42nd Street in New York called Used Ideas. I go down there when I run dry. Or, well, most of the time he'll just say Utica. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, Steven, now we all know the truth. <laughs> you had a magical typewriter. Come on, typewriter. Do your thing. Hey, pal. Can I get you a coffee or tea or anything? No, I'm good. Caffeine this late in the day. Ooh, I'll be bouncing off the walls. Cookie, brownie, muffin? Sugar gives me kidney stones. I write my nightmares out. Occasionally, somebody will say to me, I got a nightmare from reading your book. And my immediate reaction is, serves you right for reading it. Because when you get to the bottom of everything, what I'm involved in is trying to scare the bee Jesus out of people. A Freudian exorcist. Freudian exorcist. You aren't there for tea and cookies, but to serve people's darker tastes. <sighs> Finding such treasure in the trash. Do you know who this makes me feel like? Hmm, not Stephen King, strangely enough. Like his wife, Tabitha. And not just because my laundry got mixed up and I'm wearing my landlady's underwear. No, Tabitha is something of the match that lit the Stephen King fuse because without her, we may never have gotten Carrie, Stephen's first novel. Because believe it or not, there was a time before Stephen King was a world-renowned writer and just some schmo sporadically selling short stories to men's magazines. That is, until Tabitha spotted a few pages of a story that her husband had given up on. A few pages tossed in the trash, not unlike this magnificent beauty right here. That story was Carrie, and it would become the book that launched a literary legend. So before I head back to LA and begin a new phase of my own writing career, which is most certainly going to be profoundly earth shattering now that I've got the secret sauce, let's take a deeper look at Carrie. How it came to be, why it became such a phenomenon, and why it still lingers in our consciousness decades later. Join me, won't you? What's this? You are typing and you said something about tea and cookies? There is a reason Stephen King and his immense body of work have had such a grip on so many readers of so many ages for so many decades. And that reason lies within us, the many millions of constant readers of all shapes and sizes and colors, living and dead, <laughs> who have a deep, shared connection. And as is so often the case with something you love, you want to share it with others, right? So wouldn't it be grand to find a few more brand new constant readers and share with them the wild, weird, and wonderful world of Stephen King? Because I believe there's something in King's work for everyone. Yes, even for you horror haters. And I truly believe each of our lives would be just a bit richer with a little Stephen King in it. Because, ladies and gentlemen, scaring us is just a means to an end. In the end, According to Uncle Stevie, writing is about enriching the lives of those who will read your work and enriching your own life as well. It's about getting up, getting well, and getting over, getting happy, okay? Getting happy. There is a whole new field of psychiatry devoted primarily to creative types. If art is born wholly of imagination, then <coughs> Does imagination lead to forms of imaginative thinking, magical thinking even? But if art is born of a break with reality, then how deep does that rabbit hole go? 
For the artist, a break with reality may indeed be the norm. So you're saying if David McCracken is still alive, he may be a danger to himself? Not just to himself. To others. The Remora, otherwise known as Echinaeus Luceratis Mucius, feeds off scraps left over from the unequivocally superior shark, more commonly known as the shark <laughs> sucker. Hey, everybody! I'm Rocky the Romora! Don't be a mooch like me! Support the Stephen Kingdom Patreon! Mm -hmm.